day. Um, I'm really um, excited to tell you about some uh, recent work on um, uh, market design aspects of student assignment. So this is a pretty broad topic and I want to zoom in and talk about a very narrow aspect uh, of uh, some of the research uh, on market design and school assignment. So uh, as many of you know in the United States, um, most uh, uh, pupils are assigned to public schools based on their residence uh, where they live. And um, there is a concern that neighborhood assignment um, to public schools encourages sorting by type. Um, that is, the wealthy types segregate in wealthy suburbs. Uh, uh, less uh, fortunate types are left behind in uh, districts that don't have schools that are as high quality. And uh, this is not only the case in the education markets, but economists have now a number of models where sorting by type uh, is seen to perpetuate inequality uh, and segregation. Um, so one of the appeals of school choice is it has the potential to break uh, the link between where you live and uh, the school that you get to go to. And this uh, is a potentially powerful force to uh, overturn residential sorting. Um, so that's one argument that school choice advocates often say, let's break the link between the housing market uh, and school access. Now, as uh, many of you know and many of you have contributed to, there is a, a rich literature on school choice market design. Um, and a theoretical literature has inspired and has been inspired by, by issues in the field. And um, some of the more recent developments uh, more, that I'm personally excited about uh, involve thinking hard about access and uh, designing admissions policies. What's fair in terms of who should get into a school? Uh, and who should not. So that's what I call this literature on the choice function. And uh, there's some work on the choice function that I've uh, been working on uh, for the last couple of years, uh, including some work with Scott thinking about the design of reserves uh, in affirmative action systems and in uh, school choice systems. Reserves, in, in some cases, could be a, pri a priority for living near the school. Uh, and other work on affirmative action systems. So that's a topic we're going to hear some more about uh, tomorrow. Um, and so, so some questions we've looked at there are, can race neutral policies be effective substitutes for race based plans? Uh, and the quick answer is uh, not in our case. There, that's a case from Chicago's public schools. Uh, another question is, can we more effectively target affirmative action uh, using uh, application processing? And uh, there the answer is yes. I don't want to spend my l very limited time uh, on those issues because those are kind of closer to the conventional uh, market design uh, literature on school assignment. What I want to spend my time talking about is uh, a literature that uh, tries to look beyond the assignment mechanism. Okay, and so uh, there are a number of uh, uh, folks thinking in this direction. Uh, uh, Katarina has a number of uh, papers, exciting papers uh, on this topic. Uh, and <clears throat> the idea is to take a step back and think about this question about is school choice effectively uh, increasing access for disadvantaged families by breaking the link between where you live uh, and what school you go to? Okay, so the paper I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, today is uh, uh, some work with Chris Avery. So uh, what do I mean by school choice in a broader context? Um, here I want to think about the feedback between the way the allocation takes place and where people choose to live, okay? Uh, and now this is a, a question that has been studied in, a, a, uh, in depth in the literature on school vouchers, uh, especially in the 90s. There was a series of papers by folks like Dennis Apple, uh, um, Richard Romano, Tom Nekaba, uh, that tried to think about what would happen in the counterfactual worlds where we had school vouchers. Uh, these models think about the housing choice, the financing choice, property taxes, the political equilibrium. And I think uh, almost every model I've seen on this is complicated enough to require numerical approaches. Um, so uh, our motivation here is uh, at least uh, nowadays public school choice is a much more common policy than school vouchers, uh, but we don't have a, a workhorse uh, model to think about uh, some of these issues of residential sorting. So um, our goal here is to develop a, a model that we thought was going to be very simple <laughs> that yields analytical results. Uh, and so this model of warning is necessarily stripped down um, but we think it highlights some interesting new forces, okay? And so here's the, the setup, okay? So we're thinking of two different assignment rules, okay? The first is uh, neighborhood assignment. 
Uh, under neighborhood assignment, houses in a town are divided in advance into districts, and students attend schools in their district. Okay? Uh, under school choice, um, we'll say all students in a town have equal access to all schools through the lottery. Okay? And unlike a lot of the rich literature on assignment mechanisms, uh, we're going to abstract away from that. Okay? So there is no special priority in the lottery. There's no walk zone priority. Um, and the mechanism is just a fair lottery. Okay? So no distinction between the Boston mechanism or uh, deferred acceptance, so on and so forth. Uh, the project, we're thinking about two classes of models. Uh, the first model that we call the one town model. So this is partial equilibrium and flavor. Um, so the setup here is um, in terms of outside options, uh, um, <clears throat> there uh, uh, is a fixed school quality and price uh, uh, in other towns and we're thinking about the decision of an individual within a town under these two assignment rules. The uh, uh, appeal of the one town model is it's actually relatively simpler to work with than the uh, two town model. I think one reason why this 1990s style literature had to go to the computer is once you actually write down the two town general equilibrium, it's a, it's a nightmare, right? So I think Derek has supervised a thesis about this actually. So uh, what I, I hope if I have time, I'll show you that some of what we're learning from the one town model is uh, uh, robust uh, to when we think about the two town model. Okay, so uh, at a high level, what's kind of the summary of where we're headed? Okay, so uh, in, the, in this framework, uh, we'll find that school choice uh, does uh, reduce the difference between the best and the worst school uh, in a town. Okay, so there's a compression of the quality distribution uh, due to school choice. Uh, that's simply because now uh, where you live doesn't determine uh, what school you get to attend. Uh, children in a town uh, get an equal chance to attend any school. Uh, now, given our assumptions on outside options, uh, in the model we'll find that high types um, under school choice are no longer able to segregate and uh, 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 get their school that's a good match for them, so they will exit. Uh, and the same force uh, happens for low types. So since the distribution is compressed, uh, the lowest, uh, the worst school has gotten better, uh, so the house prices will increase, okay, and uh, that will uh, uh, displace the, the low types. Okay, so the first effect, the exit of the high types um, has been discussed uh, in other contexts, uh, in the voucher context in particular. Uh, but the second effect, uh, not so much. So we haven't seen much discussion of, of this phenomena. Now, uh, some of the uh, literature on related topics like uh, studies of gentrification, what happens when uh, amenities improve, talk about uh, a very related phenomenon of the displacement effect. So we've made you know, uh, the town better, so the poor folks can no longer live in the town. Okay? And that's very similar to what we're talking about here. And uh, what I hope to show you is you can have situations where um, <clears throat> school choice actually improves the quality of the worst school in a district, but uh, despite that, the most disadvantaged are worse off uh, under school choice. Okay, so this was uh, somewhat surprising. Yeah, Derek. You said you played with a two-school, a two-town model. You played with a three-town model where you can have a slum and a rich suburb and this middle thing. Where, where do the low people go? Do they all go together? Yeah, so, th I mean, that's the real issue always in urban economics, right? I mean, where do the uh, people exit and, and go to? We haven't made any progress on a three-town model. Uh, so... Um, let, me, let me show you how we model the outside option. It's going to be pretty stark, but uh, um, hopefully when I show you the two-town model, it's not, uh, not uh, that crazy. Okay, so here, here's how this model works, okay? Um, so we have students uh, who each have a type, uh, so that's Xi. It's uh, distributed according to f of x. School quality here is simply going to be uh, equal to the average type uh, attending school J, okay? Um, now, one important thing here is that there is no productive dimension of school choice. So sometimes school choice advocates say the fact that you have choice leads school quality to improve uh, through competitive means. And um, uh, we've stripped away from that. And my own personal view is the evidence for that is quite weak. Uh, okay. uh, we have a measure of houses in a town, capital M. Uh, houses are inelastically supplied. Uh, and house prices are determined uh, in equilibrium. Okay, our utility function is as follows. So you, the utility for a, a student of type X, family uh, with a student of type X, 
who attends a school with uh, quality YJ is the value for the school, okay, uh, minus the uh, price, okay. So, uh, like uh, in Zvika's talk, we're going to assume that V uh, has increasing differences, okay. Uh, that assumption amounts to saying higher types will pay more for marginal gains in quality. Um, and it's the conventional assumption that uh, generates sorting by type, okay. So, in a neighborhood equilibrium, we'll have sorting uh, by type, okay. Um, now, the, <clears throat> one of the challenges in, in models of this form is kind of what levels of heterogeneity can you allow? So uh, we have this one dimension of uh, type, okay? So you can think of that as income or resources or um, <clears throat> you could think of that potentially as ability. The other dimension that's gonna be in this model is uh, what we call partisanship, okay? So this is uh, uh, a, set, a, a set of students uh, are partisans to a particular town. So they like to live in a town. That's a reduced form way of thinking. Maybe it's convenient in terms of where they would want to work. Um, and we'll say that this is binary. Either you're a partisan or you're not a partisan. If you're a partisan, you get a bonus theta uh, for living in a town, okay? So if I'm a partisan uh, of town T, I get this additional boost theta. And the measure of partisans, uh, lowercase mt is uh, less than or equal to the supply of houses, okay? So if all partisans wanted to live in a town, they could, okay? The, uh, the students, uh, the families who are non-partisans uh, will say there are a large number of each type, okay? And um, these uh, non-partisans are, are used to uh, clear the housing market uh, if needed, okay? So this is a device to ensure housing market clearing. Okay, so let me start off with my stripped down assumption. Okay, so this, let me just emphasize, this is a very strong assumption, but it allows us to get somewhere, okay? Uh, so the assumption is what we're calling partial equilibrium, okay? So this is uh, 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 the following. There is perfect competition for school quality outside of town T, okay? Uh, that is uh, a school of each quality, Y is available on the outside market uh, at a price such that a student of type X will choose uh, <clears throat> to attend a school uh, of type uh, exactly equal to x uh, on the market. Okay, so uh, this is uh, an assumption that makes the choice trivial for nonpartisans. Okay, so a nonpartisan could always live in the town and get some quality, but they could get exactly a quality that would match their type if they left the town. So what we're really thinking about here is the, the choice for partisans. Okay, so that's the sense in which nonpartisans are a device for housing market clearing. Um, and so let me be a little bit more specific. We'll say the competitive price under this assumption uh, is chosen such that the utility uh, is maximized uh, <coughs> um, so the, uh, for school quality Y, it's maximized at Y is equal to X uh, for each X, okay? So uh, what does competitive pricing get us? Okay, so the first implication is the following. Uh, the competitive pricing rule um, given by uh, the formula there induces nonpartisan students of type X to choose schools of quality X. So this is something I've already said. So nonpartisans can exactly match their type, okay? They could get that on the outside market if the competitive pricing rule has the following form, okay? And the reason for that uh, is basically follows immediately from the first order conditions for the, for the nonpartisans. So we can talk about uh, a type's outside option now uh, with this competitive framework. So your outside option here is uh, you get exact type matching uh, and you have to pay for that. So what's going on here? So, so far this is, uh, uh, I think, I hope pretty simple. So let me show you uh, some of the, the features here. So here I have a plot of the utility of a, uh, a student against the quality of a district if, um, my type is two thirds and the shape of the, this surface in this model will be maximized exactly at two thirds. Okay, so this is the type matching idea. Now here, uh, if we plot the utility of a family relative to their outside option, okay, um, on the y-axis and on the x-axis we have your type. Uh, <clears throat> the range of families that will choose a, a school equal to two thirds instead of the outside option are the range for which this blue line is above zero, okay, the dotted line here, okay? So we're more able to match our types uh, if we're over here. Uh, now what if we have, um, so actually one point to make about this, so if we wanna think about a partisan living in the town, 
we have to think about the incentive constraint right here. Does it make sense for the guy to live in the town, uh, get a school of quality Y, get also this bonus theta, or does it make sense for me to not live in the town and get my outside option? Okay, so that's uh, the margin of decision making. Everybody to the right of the intersection, if they're partisan, stays in the town. Correct, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> another kind of example, so suppose we have two districts, uh, and suppose every partisan lives in the town. Okay, this is what the shapes of the, these curves will look like. So the guys living in district one, we check for their uh, IC constraint at the end here, and we have to see, are you gonna live in district one or district two? Uh, at this point, these guys will live, uh, the blue line guys will live in district two, okay? So this is uh, how this model essentially works, okay? So now we can be a little bit more formal. So uh, we'll say a neighborhood equilibrium uh, with D districts, Enrollments, capital M, uh, so each district lowercase d, assignments of sets of partisans, okay, so um, the types who are in the district are capital T, D, prices, uh, uh, and average types of schools such that school quality is given by the uh, process I posited. Uh, number two, each student maximizes utility uh, with the choice of where to live, okay, so if I live in the town, uh, I'm a partisan who lives in the town. My utility has to be uh, greater than or equal to um, the utility from living in any other town. Uh, um, if uh, um, we look at these two other constraints, these are IR constraints, so I have to be doing at least as well as my outside option. And if I don't live in the town, um, my utility has to be less than my outside. And then finally, housing market's clear. Uh, with the competitive price. I, I'm missing a theta here, I'm sorry. So what do we have to integrate over the nonpartisans that stayed in the town to get the rights quality? Uh, so the, uh, the implicit assumption, and this is the simplification actually, is we have uh, uh, enough nonpartisans of each type to exactly hit the average quality level. Uh, <clears throat> so the only guys who will choose to live in the town, the nonpartisans, are those who have the exact same type as the, the average quality of the school. Okay. So they're kind of second order in calculation. They're totally second order. I mean, it's really a technical device, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is neighborhood assignment. Uh, school choice is a situation where D is uh, just equal to one. There's just one district, so we don't have to think about uh, the uh, constraint about which of the, the two towns you live in. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> You can really get the kind of main idea in this paper with a simple example, okay? So let me skip over some of the formal results that we can show more generally and tell you about the simplest possible example, okay? So suppose we have a, a utility function uh, V, X, Y, okay? And uh, suppose types are uniformly distributed, okay? So how does this model work? Well, we can figure out what the competitive pricing rule is. So that was the first lemma. So uh, we just take the, the partial of, the deriv uh, of uh, V of X, Y, and then we integrate that from zero to Y. So competitive pricing implies uh, uh, this formula here. We can compute the outside option, okay, now that we know what competitive pricing is, so that's what uh, uh, we do here. And now let's think about the situation where we have two districts in town T of equal measure, okay? So what happens with school choice? So suppose all partisans reside in the town then the average quality is just going to be a half because it's uniformly distributed, so that's the average quality of the school. We plug in the uh, um, <coughs> uh, y into our competitive pricing here, so a half squared divided by two is an eighth, okay? And then we have to check the IC constraints, okay? When you do the checking of IC constraints, you'll see that they're tightest at the extremes, okay? At uh, type equals zero and type equals one. Okay, are these guys going to stay in the town or not? Okay, and provided that theta is, is high enough uh, for the partisans, they'll find it worthwhile to stay in town. Okay, so theta here has to be greater than an eighth. What about neighborhood assignment in this example? Okay, so we said there are two districts. Uh, for all partisan types to reside in the town, the guys who are uh, below a half will choose district one, the guys who are above a half will choose district two. So we easily get the uh, corresponding school qualities because of this uniformity uh, assumption. So the qualities are a quarter and three quarters, okay? Plug in to get the corresponding prices. And as you saw from the figures, we have one more IC constraint to check, okay? Uh, so what can we learn from this example? Okay, so there are th uh, three different states of the world. First, uh, under high partisanship, okay? So if there's really a value to living in the town, then under both of these assignment systems, um, all partisans will live in the town. So school choice will not induce flight, okay? 
what if we have median levels of, of partisanship? Well, we can show that there is a neighborhood equilibrium uh, with all partisans in the town, but a, in a school choice equilibrium, only a subset of partisans uh, will choose town T, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so that you could see um, by going through these calculations, the theta here uh, is less demanding than the partisanship needed for school choice. Now finally, what about low, lower levels of partisanship? And here you get to kind of the main example in this paper, okay? So uh, let me just explain this and then I'll, I'll wrap up, okay? So on the top we have school choice, and what I said is we have a compression of the distribution of school quality, okay? So here in this simple example, quality is exactly equal to a half, whereas under neighborhood assignment we had these two districts where there's more spread in the distribution, okay? What else is happening? Under school choice, the guys uh, to the left, uh, will exit, okay? Uh, meanwhile, the guys to the right will also exit, okay? Whereas under neighborhood assignment, the margins, the fraction of folks who exit is smaller, okay? So counterfactually, surprisingly here, I think, uh, at least to me, uh, school choice had, has made the worst school, in this simple example, it's just one school better, okay? But uh, the families, the more disadvantaged families are now worse off, okay? Um, and, uh, so uh, this, that's this example, and so you can show this in a little bit more general. I mean, the, the point to take away is there's this phenomenon of the ends against the middle taking place uh, uh, in this model. So, uh, <clears throat> so let me stop there. So uh, there's a lot more stuff in this paper, but um, I have totally ran out of time as usual. So uh, great. Okay. So.